Hello, everybody, and welcome today to our 19th virtual shadowing session. I'm very honored to welcome to you today a pulmonary critical care and internal medicine doctor. I usually tell my patients Dr. C, but um, yeah, thanks again for having me. My name is Nina, uh, Dr. C. I am board certified in internal medicine, so that's what I did my residency in, and I'm in my fellowship for pulmonary critical care medicine uh, at the moment. I did my residency in Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, UPMC, and I'm doing my fellowship at Wayne State in um, Detroit. I did my med school in the Caribbean. I went to American University of Antigua, and I was able to do my rotations in Miami for my third year, which is where I'm from, and then um, New York for my fourth year. So today I'm gonna to be talking a little bit about pulmonary critical care, uh, a case and what we see and what we do. So on a typical basis, what pulmonary critical care basically is, is it's a study of lung pathology, and that's a pulmonary aspect of it. And what I mean by that is anybody that has COPD, asthma, interstitial lung diseases like pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary fibrosis, pleural effusions, pneumothorax, air in the lungs, um, essentially anything to do with the lungs and shortness of breath encompasses us and we get consulted and, um, and we work with these patients and treat them. So that's the pulmonary aspect. Um, as pulmonary, we do do procedures. So there's something called bron bronchoscope. It's like a, when GI, they do like their endoscopes and colonoscopies where they take a camera and they'll go from above into the esophagus to go into the digestive system. And then they'll do a colonoscopy, which is through the, the rectum into the colon. What we do is we take a bronchoscope. So we'll go in from the mouth into the lungs. We can do that if we're gonna do a lung biopsy for lung cancer, screening, staging, or um, diagnosis management treatment, or a bronchos bronchos bronchoscopy if we're gonna diagnose just something in the lungs that we don't know what's going on. For example, if someone comes in with shortness of breath and we get a CAT scan and their CAT scan has ground glass opacities or they're just like a bunch of white on top, white all over and we don't know what it is then, and they're immunocompromised, meaning they have some type of disease like cancer or um, something that's putting their immune system to not work properly, we will do a bronchoscopy. Uh, other procedures we do as pulmonary would be thoracentesis when we'll go in with the needle and just drain the fluid when um, somebody has fluid buildup in their lungs. So that, those are, that's for the pulmonary aspect. Then what I love about my field is not only the pulmonary, but also the critical care aspect. So in ICU, you're basically, you're dealing with patients that are dying. They are very, very sick. They're the sickest of the sick, and that's where they place these patients. Um, in the intensive care unit, we have patients that are all, most of them are on the vent, um, their endotracheal tube intubated, or they have trachs and they're on the vent. Uh, they have, their blood pressures are really low, so they're requiring vasopressor medications that can only be run through central access. Central access meaning it goes directly to the heart, whether it's the jugular vein or the femoral vein or the femoral artery or the um, carotid artery. So any type of central access that requires medications, they need to come to the intensive care unit for that. Or if they're on BiPAP or CPAP, which are um, non-invasive ventilations, they're masks that you wear to help with breathing um, or high flow oxygen, which is just a higher amount of oxygen being delivered through a nasal cannula, they'll come to us in the ICU. So, and when we are in the ICU, we do a lot of procedures as well. We'll do um, central lines, arterial lines, intubations, lumbar punctures. So it's really cool to be in this field, pulmonary critical care medicine, because you get get your hands dirty, you're definitely doing procedures, but you're also using you're using your internal medicine skills every minute of the day, trying to figure out what I can do to help this patient, what is happening with the patient, and, um, and so on and so forth. So we get to manage those patients and it's really cool. And so I absolutely love what I do. So to begin, if you guys have any other questions about palm crit, you can um, put them in the box. So to begin, we'll start with the case. So we have a 28 year old um, ma male who has mild asthma. That's his only known past medical history. He comes in for shortness of breath and this patient is coming to the clinic. So it's not coming to, this patient is not coming to the ER or the um, ICU. He's just coming, he's coming to the clinic. So notice when he's in deep sleep, he would feel some slight difficulty taking in and out a deep breath. That's all he's able to tell us that 
this young guy, he's coming in um, for shortness of breath, which is a very common complaint that, um, a very common chief complaint that we as pulmonary get is just shortness of breath or dyspnea on exertion, which is very nonspecific, but it, it's probably, but it's definitely the one complaint I've seen the most. So past medical history as above, I mean, only 28, so not immunocompromised. Um, no other further medical conditions, past surgical history, patient states appendectomy, past family history, mother with pancreatic cancer, father with some type of lung disease, and brother with asthma as well. Social history is just marijuana. So anything else you guys would like to know, I'm going to pose, I'm going to ask the question and you guys can um, put it in the chat, your responses, but for the sake of time, I'll just continue going with the case. So when, when someone comes to me like this and they say that they just have shortness of breath and anything, and then we ask anything else, um, we ask for other questions in terms of their social history, their family history. Those are two big things that are really important in pulmonary to focus on. Social history does not only include a drug use as in marijuana or tobacco, um, cigarettes. Now we ask vaping and we ask that separately. Other things we ask for social history would be um, what type of marijuana, if it's unfiltered marijuana or if it's filtered marijuana. The reason is because unfiltered marijuana is the same thing as tobacco. And then we ask pack years. So if someone says that they are a smoker, we ask how many pack years did you smoke for? Um, so those are, those are the smoking questions. You have to be really specific because some patients don't like to tell you if they are smoking. So we don't always, we don't assume, we always have to ask. Other things for social history that's important are, does the patient work? Is the patient um, working, did some work? And this is really important because we've had patients that have worked in the coal mines and have developed asbestosis, have developed silicosis. There are different types of lung diseases that you get um, when you get chemical exposures or if you're getting exposed from your environment, but you don't even know it. So that's an important question to ask. Um, recent travel is really important as well because there are some pulmonary diseases that are associated geographically. For example, in the Southwest, um, there's coccidioides, and then the Northeast, there's blastomycosis and histoplasmosis. So there's certain type of endemic um, infection, pulmonary infections that are just in the air geographically. And also there's um, SARS and MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. So it's important to ask, have you traveled? That's a huge um, important question in social history. Also social history, um, it's important to know if they have any pets, that's actually really big because sometimes pets can cause hypersensitivity pneumonitis or some type of allergy that the patient has no idea that they even are allergic to pets, especially in patients with asthma. We do ask, do you have any pets or are you around any pets? Um, we have had patients that have been allergic to their pet, know they're allergic to their pet, but refuse to give up their pet. So in cases like that, we have to desensitize them. So we'll, we'll be giving them little exposures of um, like, let's say it's a dog, then we'll just be giving them antigens um, in, but it will be very monitored. So they'll get small doses and it, they'll have increasing doses in a very monitored setting with backup there with epine epinephrine needed if, um, if they go into shock or if they go in or if they get allergic reaction. Uh, other medication, there's also other medications now that we can give them if they do have um, allergies to, to pets, but they don't want to part with their pets like uh, anti-IgE Zolaire that's on the market, omelizumab. So th those are big, important uh, social history questions. And for family history, that's actually a really big one as well in the pulmonary field, the pulmonary realm. It's really important because um, there are some types of syndromes that are associated with familial inheritance, including alpha-1 antitrypsin disease. And this is a disorder where a patient has COPD and liver cirrhosis. And it has to do with the alpha one gene, and this is inherited through the Y through the X chromosome. So it could be inherited father and grandfather, and that's why you would try to ask: Does your aunt, uncle, father, um, grandparents have any type of lung disease? Also, lung cancers can be heritable as well. You're at a higher risk if you have family cancer, first generation um, with lung cancer. So we do uh, we do kind of hone in on these questions. Also, interstitial lung diseases like. Um, with like pulmonary fibrosis, that's common in uh, hereditary as well, and different types of autoimmune disorders. Like if somebody has scleroderma or lupus, that can be hereditary, it's highly hereditary, and it's important to know. 
So if this patient came to me and asked me, those are the questions that I would run through with him and specifically like to know more about. So when you have a patient that has um, asthma, you ask them, another thing that I would ask for just this asthma is how is, when were you diagnosed with asthma? And is it really asthma? Cause that's, that's really important. We've had patients come in with telling us they have COPD, but they, they have no diagnosis of COPD. Somebody just randomly decided to, tell, to think that because they smoke, they have COPD, which is not true. Actually only 10% of smokers do get COPD. It's highly um, misdiagnosed is one of those that people in the hospital see, oh, they smoke, they must have COPD, which for me is one of my biggest pet peeves because when it comes to billing and everything, you can't like insurance hates it when they're labeled as COPD, but they're really asthma. So yeah, so for the asthma, I would ask, how is your asthma or when were you diagnosed with asthma? And usually if the child is young or if the, per, if the patient is young, then they're more than likely diagnosed at a younger age. And this, um, this is important to know also because there's two different types of asthma now we are learning. And they're, diff they're mediated by different types of cells. There's Th1 type asthma and Th2 type asthma. Th1 is more allergic asthma. And that's the one that you'll see more associated with allergies, skin rashes, um, eczema. And, and that's usually, th those usually occur at a younger age because they're just so sensitive and prone to allergies. Um, so that's why, so I would ask him, this patient, when are you diagnosed with asthma? How are you diagnosed with asthma? That's another big thing too. When you diagnose a patient for asthma or COPD or any type of lung disease, uh, one of the things that you would like to do is you like to check out their lung volumes. And the way you check out their lung volumes is function test, a PFT, which is inclusive of a spirometry and lung volumes. So that's a pulmonary function test. And that's what we're gonna go through right now. So this is a pulmonary function test. And basically what a pulmonary function test is measuring is your lung volumes. So as we are, as you all are watching me here and we are sitting here breathing, as I'm talking and breathing, what this is called is um, tidal, this is a tidal volume. So this is our tidal volume here where we're just breathing in and breathing out, breathing in and breathing out. That's your normal baseline tidal volume, tidal breathing is what we call it. So that's what we measure. We measure how much air is coming into your lungs and how much are you expelling as you're just sitting there doing nothing. Then if I was to tell you to breathe out, to take in, or sorry, not, not breathe out, take in as much as you can pass. So if you're just breathing in and then I tell you to, to take in as much as you can, inspire into your lungs, take in a deep breath as much as you can on top of your normal breathing, that's what we call IRV or inspiratory reserve volume. So you're just breathing. Normally, as we're talking, I say, take in, take in, take in a deep breath, take in a deep breath. So that's inspiratory reserve volume. And that's what we measure to see if you have a problem in trying to take in a deep breath. Because let's say I, I take in a deep breath and I can only do 200 cc's, but then you take in a deep breath and you can do 400. Then there's a problem with getting air in. And so these lung volumes kind of help us see that. So that's inspiratory reserve volume, that's tidal volume. Then, then if I tell you the same thing, you're just breathing normally, you're breathing normally, then I tell you to exhale, exhale, exhale as much as you can, that's your expiratory reserve volume. And that's how much, um, then we would, we would see, are you having difficulties expelling air, problems with exhalation? So that would be your um, expiratory reserve volume. Then after I tell you to exhale as much as you can, whatever is left in your lungs is called residual volume. So we measured that too. So you're just breathing in, breathing in. I tell you to inhale, inhale, inhale as much as you can. Let's say you get 200 cc's, 250 cc's, two point, or that would be, um, yeah, to 250 cc's. And, and for your age and your body type and your height, you should be at 500 and that's a big discrepancy. So we have our numbers that you need to be at and then what you will be at. And then, um, Okay, so that's the inspiratory. Then you're breathing in, breathing in, breathing in. I tell you to exhale, exhale, exhale as much as you can. That's your expiratory reserve volume. And on top of your expiratory reserve volume, meaning you exhale as much as you can, whatever is left in your lungs is your residual volume here. And that's whatever is left in your lungs. Then your functional residual capacity is just your, whatever you're breathing in, you're breathing in. I tell you to exhale as much as you can and whatever is left in your lungs. So your expiratory reserve volume plus your residual volume is your functional residual capacity. So all of these actually have meaning and importance um, to diagnose what is going on in the lungs. So going back to this page. All right. So this is important because if you have COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the problem with that is you're not able to 
exhale. You have chronic obstruction. So you have something obstructing your lungs from opening up. So you have a problem with, in, with exhaling. Inhaling, you're fine. So you, I would expect the inspiratory reserve volume on this patient to be fine. But then I would expect the ERV and the residual volume to be a problem because they cannot they cannot exhale. So if you cannot exhale, then you're going to have a higher amount of volume in your lungs because you're having difficulty exhaling. And what's happening in these patients are their airways are just collapsing on themselves. And that's what's causing all this air to just stay. And um, that's why we treat them with bronchodilators because the inhalers help open the lungs to help ex exhale, to help um, all that trapped air leave the lungs. Essentially, that's the pathophysiology of um, COPD and asthma. So in asthma, so then what, this is the spirometry part. This whole thing right here is what we call PFT, pulmonary function test. Pulmonary function test consists of spirometry along with lung volumes. Spirometry, um, when I'm reading a PFT, we get these on patients and the way that they're done is in this. It's done um, in a plethysmography plethysmograph, I still, I can never say that word, but it's done in this like gas chain, this chamber um, that's made of glass. And then you put your mouth on this piece here. And that's when, that's when you're just breathing. They'll tell you the respiratory therapists usually do this. They'll tell you, breathe in normally, breathe out, breathe in, breathe, breathe out, breathe in, breathe in, breathe in, breathe in. And that's calculated here. It's it processed through here. And then that's calculated. And then they tell you to breathe normally. And then they'll tell you to breathe out, breathe out, breathe out, breathe out. We've had patients pass out when doing this, especially if they have just such bad lungs and they aren't able to do it. But um, yeah, so that's basically how we do it. So when looking at a sprong, or PFT, the first thing that we look at is the ratio, which is your forced expiratory volume in one second over your, your forced vital capacity. So this is the ratio that we look at, and this determines if one is going to have obstruction or restriction. And then when you're looking at these, there's like a bunch of different there's a bunch of different um, like lines and numbers here, but what we look at is the percent predicted. So we look at the percent predicted and then that's here, 73. So this page, and then our normal is, eight, is 70%. So if you're higher than 70%, if you're normal or higher than 70%, then your chances of obstruction are, are low. I'm not going to say that it's not there, but they're low. And then if they're lower than 70%, then you are by definition of a pulmonary function test, you have obstruction. So here, this patient has 73%. So already I'm thinking, okay, I don't think that this patient has an obstructive disease. And, and then I'll look at the FE, FEV1, which is the forced expiratory volume in one second. Now we said that, so asthma and COPD both are problems with expelling air. The difference between the two is asthma is reversible and COPD is irreversible or yeah, it's irreversible. Um, and this, this you can see because COPDers, they need to be on their inhalers every day. If they're not on their inhalers, they will not be able to breathe. They'll wheeze like very, they'll wheeze a lot. So with asthma, they, they're, it's reversible. So they can take a like a bronchodilator, um, albuterol, steroids, and then the inflammation, all the cells that are kind of causing this airway obstruction will, will help go away. And that's, and that's how they essentially are treated. So this here on a PFT, you can see that there's pre-bronchodilator. Oh, sorry. So there's pre at bronchodilator and post bronchodilator. So that's something else that we look at on the PFT. Pre bronchodilator means prior to using the bronchodilator and then post bronchodilator are the numbers after using the bronchodilator. And the bronchodilator that uses albuterol and that's, um, we give two puffs of albuterol and that's a beta one agonist. No, it's beta two agonist, sorry. So beta two agonist and that's albuterol. So we use pre and post. So you're looking at the, so I'm looking here at the ratio and I'm like, okay, this patient is 73%. So then I go to the FEV1. If a patient has obstruction, the FEV1, the force expiratory volume in one second will tell you, will tell you how bad the obstruction is. Um, but we already said that this patient doesn't have obstruction. Um, force expiratory volume, that's 121%. So I'm like, okay. Then the force vital capacity, 165. So then I'm like, okay, these are too advanced to um, talk about. You, you'll learn about that more if you do go into pulmonary. But um, so these are the three things that you should know for your exams, uh, FEV1 over FVC, FEV1 and FVC. 
So now I'm thinking, okay, well, I know that this patient has asthma, so he must have, or if, even if I didn't know that this patient has asthma, then what you look for when you, after you're looking at the pre, then you look at the post and you look to see what, what changes here. If the patient has a change in 12% difference between pre-bronchodilator and post-bronchodilator in the FEV1 or the FBC, a change of 12% in either the FBC or the FEV1 plus a 200 cc change in the predicted pre-bronchodilator and actual post-bronchodilator, then that's the diagnosis and criteria for asthma. So just to repeat that, it's a 12% change in either the FEV1 or the FVC, along with a 200 cc change in the predicted pre-bronchodilator and actual post-bronchodilator value. So I'm looking here, I'm like, oh, this is 1.72 and this is 2.53. So that's more than 200 cc's and that's more than 12%. So this patient definitely has asthma. Now, what does that mean? So forced expiratory volume in one second. So remember I told you that um, asthma and COPD are both a spectrum of obstructive diseases. One is reversible, one's irreversible. So this, there's a problem in expelling volume. So they're having problems in, um, in exhalation. So this is just forced expiratory volume, essentially. And here it's low. 1.72 is low for this patient who should be at 2.09. So we said that we have our values that per the patient's gender, height, um, male, their gender, their height, and their ethnicity, and their age, they have, we have a cutoff. And that's what this cutoff is, the actual. So we compare what they are based what they are and then uh, compare that to what they should be. So this patient should be 2.09, but he can only expel 1.72, but, but you give him the bronchodilator and he's suddenly able to expel 2.53. So that's the post bronchodilator change. And that's the definition of um, a bronchodilator response. Okay, so that's the spirometry part. So this patient clearly has asthma. But then that you have your total lung capacity here and his is normal. So that's the actual. And then this is, this is his 92%, 5.05. Nine, so you look at the percent predicted his 92%. And then he's 5.05, which is a little more actually than his, than what it should be slightly higher, but that could be because um, he has asthma sometimes. So they do have air trapping. And if they have air trapping, then they'll have just higher lung capacity, meaning that there's just more volume of air in their lungs. Then the residual volume, remember we were talking about the residual volume after you're breathing normally, you're breathing normally, you exhale, you exhale, you exhale, whatever's left in your lungs is called residual volume. So here his residual volume, slightly higher, but only 44%. So it's not terrible for him. And then there's your DLCO. And then we'll get into DLCO in a little bit. So that patient clearly has asthma. Um, so then another part of pulmonary function test is what we call flow volume loops. So flow volume loops just demonstrate how one is breathing um, on inspiration and expiration, and how much volume of lungs is coming out of there, out of their, how much volume of air is coming out of their lungs. So this is normal. If you're age 20 um, or, or younger, this is like normal meaning. And what's interesting about these loops is inspiratory curve is on the bottom and expiration is on the top. So it's like you're inhaling, you're inhaling, and then you're exhaling. This is how it normally should look. Now, when somebody has asthma or COPD, COPD, asthma or COPD, we said that it's a problem in exhalation. So that's why this curve is really, really indented. And it's just not as flow, as flow smooth. It's not smoothly flowing as it should be. In this normal patient, you could see that it's freely freely flowing, it's able, the patient's able to breathe out to a high level, meaning it's peak expiratory flow, the patient can achieve the proper peak expiratory flow, and then can exhale at a normal rate. Here, there, the patient cannot um, obtain peak expiratory flow, can only get to here, and can exhale, but there's some problems in the exhalation. In severe obstruction, they can't even exhale properly at all because they have so much residual volume. There are, their residual volumes are really high. They just have so much air in their lungs. These severe COPDers, they can't get their air out. Um, and moderate severe obstruction as well. 
This part here, when it's supposed to be reaching here, is what we call peak expiratory flow. And in one second, a norm, a, somebody who has normal lungs, who doesn't smoke, who doesn't have asthma, who doesn't have COPD, should by should ideally exhale about 70 to 80% of their tidal volume in that one second. So I told you to exhale now completely. You should be able to exhale about 70 to 80% of your full tidal volume in that one second. I actually did my pulmonary function test just for fun. They're not fun. They're actually really hard, but um, I, I got like 77. I was like, okay, good. My lungs are good. But yeah, so um, that's what the peak expiratory flow is. And then, so we said that the expiratory curve is on the top part and then inspiratory is on the bottom part. So you can see here things that are things that cause problems in inhalation would be things that so that um, affect the trachea or things that affect yeah this this part it's like the trachea going down things that affect your throat like laryngeal edema swelling in your throat croup all those disorders that um, if you have like a big abscess and you just can't breathe in if you were intubated and then recently got extubated those will cause problems here in um, the inspiratory curve. This is kind of just showing what we were talking about. Here's normal. Yeah, like we said, the bottom part's your inspiratory, the top part's your expiratory. That's your peak expiratory flow, It which should be ideally uh, 70 to 80 in one second. And then here you can see coving. So coving is what we, we talked about, that they're having problems um, expelling air. That's just a term that we use. When you have a restriction, like let's say somebody has a restrictive lung disease, like they have... Um, pulmonary fibrosis, or they have just something not allowing the air, the lungs to expand. That's what we would call restriction. And so in that case, because the lungs cannot expand, their lung volumes are going to be low and their inspiratory is affected a lot more than their expiratory, but their lung volume should be here because it's a flow volume loop, but it's not there. It's going to be here. It's going to be smaller lung volumes and it's going to affect inspiratory more because they just can't take in that deep breath because they're restricted. So that's how you can kind of tell difference between restriction and obstruction on a flow volume loop curve. Okay, so this is going into um, COPD kind of, so we said that 70% is the cutoff, FEV1 to FVC ratio, which is your forced expiratory volume in one second over forced vital capacity is 70% is your normal, um, is a normal, is a number that we look at because you, because you should be exp exhaling 70 to 80% of your total volume in um, one second. So if it's less than 70, you're going to have obstruction. And FEV1 will tell you if it's mild, moderate, severe, or very severe. So if your FEV1 is um, between 50 to 80%, then you have moderate. If it's if you have a ratio less than 70, but your FEV1 is greater than 80, then you're mild. So 50 to 80 will be moderate, then 30 to 50 will be severe, and then very severe would just be below 30%. And if you're very severe, you're already on oxygen. And we have patients on oxygen within group three and four. For for four, you're for sure on oxygen. And unfortunately, um, it's hard to treat these people because there's not really too much that can be done, which we will go over. So this is basically kind of just a pattern of um, spirometry to talk about. Uh, so we look at the ratio, we talk about the cutoff here. We said if it's less than 70, then it's gonna be an obstruction, obstructive pattern here. You look at the total lung capacity. If your total lung, if your, F, if your ratio is less than 70, your FVC is low as well. Then you look at your total lung capacity and this could tell you if it's a mixed pattern because sometimes you can have restriction and obstruction. If you have very, very, very severe asthma that can give you both because um, asthma, like we said, is an obstructive pattern. So if you're, if you have severe asthma, then you're going to be air trapping so much that you're, that it will look like COPD. So your total, if your total lung capacity is high, that will give you your obstructive. Then we said, if you have a normal ratio or a higher ratio, you look at your FVC and then you look at your total lung capacity. And we said that you, in a restrictive pattern, your total lung capacity will be low because when you're trying to take in a deep breath, there's nowhere for your lungs to move. So that's why your total lung capacity will be low. And then you can look at your DLCO, which we'll go over in a minute to tell you, um, a, to further your diagnosis. So your diffusion capacity, um, your DLCO, diffusion loading capacity of carbon monoxide, what we look at, um, that's basically how the oxygen gets into the rest of your body. 
So the, the point of the lungs are to take in oxygen and to give it to the rest of your body and to exhale CO, um, CO2, carbon dioxide. So the way you take in oxygen is it goes through your trachea here, and then it goes into your bronchi, your main stem bronchi. And then from there, it's like a bunch of, it's like a tree and basically it goes down all the way to the alveoli. And in the alveoli, the oxygen get picked up by red blood cells and the alveoli have capillaries that are running by the alveoli and the oxygen gets picked up by the RBCs, the red blood cells. And then it gets, it goes into, um, into your, your bloodstream to go to other organs that need to all the organs that need it essentially. So things that can cause problems in the DLCO or how we measure it. This is the alveolar capillary membrane that, um, the alveolar here, the capillary here. So anything that disrupts the alveolar capillary membrane will cause decrease in the diffusion of oxygen into your body because this is the way oxygen gets into your body. So if you have a thickened barrier between your alveoli and your capillaries, like a thick barrier because you have pulmonary fibrosis or you have interstitial lung disease, then that would decrease your, um, your oxygen carrying capacity. Um, so yeah, that's membrane surface area, membrane thickness that we said, then surface area. So if somebody has emphysema, I have a picture. Yeah. So if somebody has emphysema here, then there's areas of their lungs that look like this. And you can see here that this, all this looks like is just straight black. There's no, um, there's no lung markings within these areas here. They're just big blebs is what we call it. So these areas of the lung do not participate in gas exchange. So when when, they, when this patient is blowing or trying to take in a deep breath, those there, that area of the lung is basically dead. It does not participate in taking in oxygen to give to the rest of the body or diffusing out CO2. They just take in a deep breath and the oxygen just stays there. It doesn't help. It does not move the oxygen across the, um, the alveolar capillary membrane in those specific areas. So membrane surface area is something else that can decrease your diffusion capacity. Um, membrane thickness, like we said, interstitial lung disease. Other things that can cause membrane surface area to be decreased if someone had a lobectomy. We have a lot of patients that if they have lung cancer in one certain area, we just take out that lobe of the lung or if they only have one lung. Um, pulmonary hypertension can do this too. Anemia, because if you have a decrease in your RBCs, then what's going to carry the oxygen to the rest of your body? So anemia could um, affect that as well. So asthma, we said, is a long-term inflammatory disease of the airways. Um, we said that this is a reversible airflow, airflow obstruction. It's e easily triggered um, by certain triggers within the environment, genetics, uh, pets, almost anything can trigger their asthma. Cold is a big one. We have a lot of patients here up north with cold-induced um, asthma. And so bronchospasms, that's wheezing. That's when your airways are trying to open, but they just can't because because of different inflammatory factors that are just stopping it from um, opening and it needs, they need bronchodilators. So when we talk about asthma, we talk about different stages. Uh, we classify asthma as intermittent mild, chronic persistent mild, chronic persistent moderate, or chronic persistent severe. And the way that the days are determined is by their daytime symptoms and their nighttime symptoms. So if their nighttime symptoms are um, two to three times, or if the, grad, the worse that their symptoms get, as in the more it occurs, the higher they're gonna be on our spectrum. And then peak flow is something that we measure in these patients. And we, took, we said earlier, the peak flow is how much you're able to blow out in one second. So if you can do 80%, that's normal. We said 70 to 80 is normal. But um, asthmatics, their peak flow for them could be different than ours. So we say that's why of your maximum for it. An asthmatic, their maximum could be 300, but then they do it on a day where they're feeling short of breath and they're only 100. That's a severe flag and that's when they call us and we know that they're gonna be going into an exacerbation and we give them steroids. This is how you treat. So there's different, we call it step up therapy, step one, step two, step three, step four. And this is determined once again by this chart here. So if my patient tells me that they're having, they're having um, symptoms about five times a week and they're having to wake up about like once every week because of shortness of breath, then I'll up their therapy. So we usually start out with a short acting beta agonist, um, which is albuterol. And then we'll, we'll go up to a low dose inhaled corticosteroid. And then we'll do a long, uh, long acting beta agonist with the inhaled corticosteroid. And then 
kind of just change up the dose. And then um, at, at, when it's step six and they have failed these, we consider them for monoclonal antibodies like Nucala, Depsicent, um, Zolaire, Omelazumab. Yeah, so these are the monoclonal antibodies that we spoke about. So we told, I told you earlier that there's two different types of asthma. There's TH1 and TH2. Here's TH2. You have different mediators here. That's basically what determines what type of asthma it is. Um, certain immunoglobulin cytokines, receptor antagonists and agonists play a role in determining what type of asthma. And then you can, we have now come to an awesome era in, in um, medicine where we can target the specific immunoglobulin. So there's been a lot of different changes with asthma, which is great because these patients really suffer. So what do you guys think this is? This is just a spirometry, okay? We look at the ratio. I told you to look at the percent predicted. This patient has an FEV1 to FVC ratio of 33. And their FEV1 is only 17. You don't see 12% here. And there's no greater... This is this goes from 0.49 to 0.53, which is not 200 cc's. And this goes 1.94 to 2.11. So I mean, even if this was to meet the 200 cc cutoff, this is not 12%. So this does not meet asthma criteria. But this patient does not have 70%. This patient has only 33% with a very severe FEV1. That's so low. 17%. So this patient is definitely on oxygen. Just by reading that, I could tell you that this patient is on oxygen and it's probably on like four liters oxygen at all times because the patient can't even blow out. Tries to blow out and the forest expiratory volume is only 17. Oh, that's so sad. Okay. The patient should be at 2.82, but the patient's only at 0.49. That's crazy. If you guys said severe COPD, obstructive disease, you're correct. This is just showing a picture of emphysema. So this is an example of um, a restrictive pattern. So here you can see that the ratio, when you look at it, it's 75, and then you look at the FVC and FEV1, and you notice that even though the ratio is 75%, both of these are reduced. The, the FVC is 55% and the FEV1 is 52, but they have a normal ratio. So then you look at the TLC, the total lung capacity, and that's decreased. So this, this is pointing towards a restrictive pattern. Why? Because um, they're trying to inhale, but they just can't because their total lung capacity has just decreased and their FVC and FEV1 are both low, but their ratio is normal. So we send when the ratio is normal or higher that you're thinking more restriction if they have decreases in their FVC and FEV1 and their TLC is low. Okay, so I think we're gonna have to get through this case pretty quickly, but um, all right, so we have a 32 year old female, history of diabetes, hypertension, comes to the ER for shortness of breath, very tachypnic, which means um, breathing at a high respiratory rate on exam and diaphoretic, meaning they're sweating. Cannot elicit too much from patient for, this patient comes to the ER, so not clinic. Cannot elicit too much information from patient, husband comes and says they were at a party last week. So vital signs, you can see here, the heart rate's 125, so that's tachycardic. Blood pressure is extremely elevated, setting 78% on room air and breathing at 38. So this is a real case. Um, some, Not all the facts were taken exactly because of HIPAA purposes, but this is a real case, and this is something that we are seeing every day. So um, just to move it up, what else you want to order? Differentials. This is the chest X-ray. So the first thing that we order is a chest X-ray. Um, so to know bad, you have to know normal. This is normal. You could see that there's black here, which is aeration. You barely see any black here. So in case you're thinking COVID, you are correct. So what you see in a patient with COVID is what we call bilateral ground glass opacities are basically just a bunch of white all over and not much black. If there's black, then that's oxygenation and ventilation occurring. But this patient clearly has like this left upper lobe sparing only. So the patient was intubated, intubated. You can see here this white thing going into the trachea. So the patient was intubated and these are the poor lungs. This is a normal x-ray. 
markers that we do obtain on patients that have COVID are ferritin, D-dimer, CPK, and these are just inflammatory markers. So talking a little bit about COVID, what is SARS-CoV-2 that you guys keep hearing in the news? So this is a virus and this is obtained or you can get this virus through cough or sneezing droplets. It can go from the eyes, it can go into the nose or it can go into the mouth. The virus enters the body primarily through the nose, but it can also get in, like we said, through the mouth and the eyes. And the reason why six feet is because coughing or talking even can um, release the particles if one is not wearing masks or if both people are not wearing masks. So SARS-CoV-2 virus, this is an RNA virus and this is how it looks. It has what we call spike proteins um, around it in a viral capsule. When And we on our bodies, especially our lungs and our heart, we have what we call ACE2 receptors. These receptors bind the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. When that happens, the virus enters the cell body and it releases its RNA. So the RNA is now in the cell of the host or our cell, we'll say. So we take that RNA and we run it through our ribosome and it goes through a process of translation. So the RNA from SARS-CoV-2 gets replicated over and over and over and then our cells release the viruses. And then so now our body becomes flooded with this, with these viral particles. So like we said, the, this, this is a picture of the lung. So this is the trachea. And then you have your right main stem bronchus and your left main stem bronchus. And then you have your bronchioles, your smaller airways, and then your even smaller airways that go all the way down to the alveoli. So when I tell my patients about them, um, like see their lung diseases or how the lungs are, I say it's like a tree. So you have your big airways and your smaller airways. And then um, the leaves are like gas bubbles or alveoli. So alveoli are filled with type one and type two alveolar cells. These are the cells that, um, that make the alveoli and type two alveolar cell is very important because that creates surfactant and surfactant is needed to keep the lungs moving. It's needed to keep the lungs opening and closing, opening and closing, because if the lungs don't have the surfactant, they're stiff. They don't move. They need the surfactant to help move. So this is a COVID-19 lung. And this is, and so basically what happens is um, we said that the virus comes into the body because someone gets it from breathing. And then the cells uptake the viral particle, the RNA is released, the body replicates it and then releases new particles. The particles go into the lungs. What happens when it goes into the lungs? You get macrophages that try to come and kill it because that's just a normal body defense. And, and then once the macrophages are out, the body is like, oh, this is crazy. We need to help. So then the body gets its own activation of its immune system by releasing cytokines, IL-6, TNF-alpha, IL-1, all these new ones that um, interfere on that, that um, are being studied today. And, and then all of these attack the type 2 alveolar cells. And we said that the type 2 alveolar cells are necessary to produce surfactant, otherwise the lungs stay stiff. So then they keep, dis they keep destroying the poor, the poor little type 2 alveolar cells, and they can't produce the surfactant anymore. So you basically get a severe loss of anti-inflammatory lung protectant surfactant, and you need that surfactant. So this is a healthy lung, um, like we spoke about, kind of like the DLCO that we spoke about, the RBCs uptaking the oxygen. But yeah, basically, um, this, this gets the alveoli here, you can see it's getting destroyed. The surfactant is not there anymore. And all these cytokines are coming in and just destroying the poor little alveoli. It get, and then it get become, because there's no surfactant to for the lungs to open and close, open and close, it gets filled with all this weird stuff like fluid and protein rich fluid and cells and debris. And then essentially we get this, all these little alveoli just filled with stuff, what we call ground glass opacity. So that's essentially what happens with COVID and that's why it's scary and that's why it's bad and that's why you should all wear masks and social distance and wash your hands stay away from immunocompromised people. Okay, so basically uh, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 affects every almost every single system in the body. Neurologic wise, it causes headaches, dizziness, and you guys can see the list here. It causes all sorts of neurologic problems. It causes kidney injury. It causes liver injury. It causes um, GI upset and it causes clots. It causes clots in the, in the, in the veins, it causes clots in the um, lungs, in the head like strokes, and then it causes a lot of problems to the heart too, which is what they're finding out now a lot as well. 
um, heart failure, cardiomyopathies, arrhythmias. And that's because the heart also has a lot of ACE2 receptors. And that's what SARS-CoV-2 needs to get uptaken is the receptor. Besides the lungs, the heart has the most, second to the lungs. So endocrine, it, um, it also gives hyperglycemia and DKA and then a lot of derm disorders now we're learning. So labs, these are normal labs that we order. If a patient were to come to me in the ICU, these are like what I would order and they all have like a certain meaning. All right, guys. So I hope you guys enjoyed this talk. Um, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I love this quote because med school is not easy. Undergrad is not easy, but um, you guys are all here and we are going to, we as in like America, really needs you guys as doctors in the future. The, the state of healthcare and just medicine in general is going to need a lot of help in terms of being doctors. So I'm glad that you guys are all pursuing what you're pursuing and keep doing it, keep going for it. Um, you guys can find me at on Instagram at Neenzi. I have a website. Um, soon I will have a YouTube to explain more pulmonary stuff. And uh, that's my email address if you want it. I guess. Um, so it was good talking to you. If I, ha I think we have about like 10 minutes for questions. So if you want to um, bring them up. Okay, we can start. Um, what is your daily life as like a pulmonary critical care? Yeah, that's a great question. So it really depends on what rotation I'm on. If I'm doing pulmonary, if I'm doing crit, because you can't do them both at the same time. When you're in critical care, it's 12 hours in the ICU every day for five days, Monday through Friday, unless you're on call, then you'll have seven days straight. But um, Monday through Friday, it will be 12 hour shifts, um, all five days. And then that's when I'm in the ICU. So I'll just be dealing with like a lot of sick people, I'll be doing procedures, I'll be trying to figure out what I can do to help them. We've been getting a lot of COVID. So I mean, it's a lot of taking care of the vent and um, getting them the whatever's approved by FDA tomorrow, today, it changes by day. So <laughs> Uh, we basically just trying to make sure that they're oxygenating and they're ventilating if they're on the vent and they have COVID. Um, pulmonary wise, my days differ in terms of if I'm doing pulmonary consults in the hospital or if I'm doing pulmonary outpatient clinic. If I'm doing pulmonary consults in the hospital, it could be a patient that's just admitted for like cellulitis and has shortness of breath and they consult me, something like that. So I'll see patients in in the hospital. And then if we need to do a procedure on them, like a bronchoscope to see what's going on the lungs, we will. Or if we need to do PFTs in the hospital, we will. Uh, and then if I'm in clinic outpatient, then it's just normal nine to five. I like today, I just see patients in the clinic for whatever. And I order my tests. Like I order a lot of CAT scans, pulmonary function tests, AB arterial blood gases, uh, echocardiograms of the heart because the heart and the lungs are very intertwined. So Uh, how did you know you wanted to go into pulmonary critical care? Uh, I like, I can, I'm i always doing something. So I'm always on my feet and palm crit gives you the best of both worlds. You get your outpatient to connect with patients. But when you want to get into, when you want to dive deep, you have ICU. So it's just such a good mix of worlds for me that I think it's just so perfect. But I'm also very biased. Uh, sorry. How has COVID affected your day-to-day -day life in PCCM? Yeah, it's affected it a lot. Um, we always have to think COVID on our heads, whether it's a patient who had COVID in the past and now they're coming to me in the clinic with shortness of breath. These are residual symptoms, which we are seeing as in shortness of breath, continued cough, pulmonary fibrosis, weird pulmonary function tests, like those spirometries we were reading, their, their numbers will be off and we'll be like, what? But they had COVID in the past. So we're, we're learning more and more. Um, it's affected it because my risk as palm crit is very, very high compared to any other specialty because we see these patients every day. They're on the vent, they're mine. They're not anybody else's. And it, like nobody else deals with them. GI, anybody, um, endo, hemonc, room, cardio. It's just palm crit. So our exposure is really high and we have to always gown up. So I'm always double thinking, do I have two, two gowns on? Do I have like th two masks plus my face shield and my hair in a scrub cap? So yeah, it's affected in that sense. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's affected it in terms for ICU, I would say that way uh, in, and then the palm clinic, we have to think about what's going to happen next to our patient and what should we do to work them up?
next steps. Uh, thank you. Uh, what are some other specialties that you commonly work with and in what capacity? Cardio. We work with cardio a lot because shortness of breath is nine out of 10 times either heart related or lung related. So cardio for sure. Um, in capacity. So there's also a cardiac critical care unit. So they deal with like um, patients, but I myself could, can do like CCU and then that's cardiac care unit. So that's a uh, uh, that's a ICU, but they deal with post um, cabbage. So if someone undergoes like a bypass surgery or uh, they have a heart attack and they have a stent placed, they're usually placed there, or they have like um, cardiogenic shock, um, shock from their heart just not pumping, then they're on vasopressors that are dealt with there. If they're on an LVAD, which is left ventricular assist device, um, a, a device that's essentially helping the heart pump for itself or if they're on ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, meaning heart and lungs outside of the body, um, that's that could be in CCU too. So we work with them a lot. Anesthesia is one that we work with a lot too because of intubation. So when we tube or they tube, it's um, we work with them a lot as well. We work with every specialty, honestly. Like if there's, there's every specialty has its own emergencies, but when they have the emergency, they come to us. So we work with every specialty, but I would say cardio number one. Is vaping considerably worse than cigarette smoking? Yes, because of the way that it's the different type. Well, it depends on what you're vaping. If you're vaping like marijuana, then I mean, it depends what type of marijuana too. So it really depends on what the ingredients are of what's being vaped versus um, what's being smoked. They all kill your lungs either way. So just don't do it. <laughs> Have you seen anything in your practice where there are severe cases suddenly from vaping rather than smoking? Yeah, we had a, a few vaping associated lung injuries, the Valley, uh, E-Valley. Um, and unfortunately it was a young patient. We had to send them for a lung transplant to U, U of M. Uh, and then there was a couple other ones that we saw just vaping and they had just white all over their cat skin and we had to place them on steroids for a long period of time. Um, is it higher to die? Is it is it harder to diagnose like athletes or singers who might have higher level capacity of like volume, lung volume? Sorry, that's a good question. Um, is it? I don't really understand. Is it harder to diagnose? So they don't yeah, actually have higher lung capacity. That's a myth. And patients that uh, that's they could have, I guess, higher lung if they have higher lung capacity it's because they've been trained to breathe in and breathe out more than a normal person. So if that's in that sense, that makes, that would kind of clarify that, I guess, but they're not born with it. You can become trained to use all of your lung capacity. Um, I mean, if I give you exercises now to scream and bellow, then you will. And that's essentially what we actually do in pulmonary rehab for patients with COPD and they have um, poor expiratory volumes and their lung capacities aren't great. That's those same, a lot of similar exercises are what we do for our patients in pulmonary rehab. Is it harder to, I didn't really understand the question. Is it harder to diagnose patients with that? Kind yeah. of, I guess, because they're so trained in it. But if you have COPD, you'll know, they still will, they still won't perform as normal. Uh, there's a question on how long it takes uh, the process of diagnosing takes, given that there are many tests to run, results to look at, especially if the results uh, need to be coming in quickly for emergency situations. You have a, you kind of have a diagnosis in your mind and you treat right away. You, um, the next question, sorry, continue. No, you're good. God, I have like four. What? can you do or what would you do if someone likes about their smoking history? That happens all the time, all the time. Unfortunately, you just document, you take for what that you take, what they say for their word and you just document because you don't have another choice. Another question was, can anxiety play effect on overall breathing long-term? Um, yeah, absolutely. Anxiety can definitely play an effect. In fact, we get patients that just are are so anxious that their title, their volumes are so low when they're breathing in and breathing out, but it's actually just, and they keep saying they have shortness of breath and that's their chief complaint. They keep coming over and over for it. So yeah, we do actually send these people to behavioral therapy and, um, and prescribe them Xanax and cognitive behavioral therapy. 
Um, when, like last two questions. How long does it take for your lungs to heal post COVID? We're still finding that out today, unfortunately. Okay, and then my final question is, do you have last minute advice to pre-health students or pre-med students? Um, med school is getting hard. I know I, I was told like most of you guys are like undergrads. Med school is definitely getting harder and harder to get into, but I am, especially these days with everyone doing cool things like what you guys are doing. Social media is such a great tip. Get into research. That's huge. Try to do something that will stick out more than normal. I know it's really hard with COVID where you can't travel and do like a big social mission or anything like that, but everything you're doing is great. Continue doing it um, in terms of, you know, starting new organizations, reaching out to p different people for research opportunities, trying to get your name on papers here and there for research. Um, there's so much more now with COVID in terms of research that you can get your hands on. Um, when I was an undergrad, I started a club. It was called Children at Heart. And um, it was an organization that went to children's hospitals and during like big events, like Christmas, Easter, we would bring joy to them. We would bring them like arts and crafts and activities and stuff. So just be creative, innovative with what you guys can do. But um, there's a need for doctors. So I have faith in all of you. <laughs> and also Caribbean med school is not, for me personally, I didn't think it was any different than going to a regular med school. My husband went to a regular med school. I went to a Caribbean med school. He's internal medicine practicing now and I'm in fellowship, but I'm exactly where I want it to be. So don't, I don't believe in a stigma behind that at all. Great. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was such a pleasure to get to learn more about your journey and your specialty. Um, for all of my students joining us today, thank you all for coming. Um, don't forget to comment and rate the talk on our website. You can find it under the speaker profile um, when you are about to take the quiz. Please. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you, too. Um, please help us raise money. Um, we are a free program for students, um, for all of you guys to come uh, and get your shadowing hours. Um, we uh, don't want this money to come from your guys' pockets. We really want to try to raise this money. And so this is a community effort. Um, please um, pull out your phone and scan this barcode um, on the screen right now. I'll leave it up for about 30 seconds. Um, and this is just uh, so that we can keep virtual shadowing free for everybody. We recently had a large influx of students due to both social media and schools promoting us. Um, and so we do have to upgrade our platforms. Um, and so um, the sooner we can do this, the better.